Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome to marine invertebrates. I think that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> Any marine invertebrates here today? Anybody? No? Uh, my name is Linda Holmes, and I work at NPR. Uh, I host a podcast called Pop Culture Happy Hour, and I am not a, a scientist. Uh, but when I had the opportunity to find an interesting event to perhaps um, help moderate, I gravitated to this one because it looked so interesting to me. So I dove right in, so to speak. Sorry. <laughs> Terrible water puns. <laughs> and we're going to have a chat. I'm going to ask both of you to, to introduce yourselves, if you would, um, because since I'm not a scientist, I'm afraid I'll say something wrong. So, uh, Sai, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Sai Montgomery, and um, gosh, often I introduce myself as a former swine herd, but we just had one pig. My a previous book was called The Good Good yes, Pig. Yes, yes. So, but this is my, my first book about a marine invertebrate. Everybody else I've written about in my 26 books has been um, vertebrate animals. But most of the world, as we know, most of the animals on the world are invertebrates, and most of them live in the sea. It's a big place. It's a big place, lots of animals. Julie, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Julie Burwald, and I used to be a scientist, but now I'm a science writer. And um, let's see, I often introduce myself as a science writer lately. Yeah. Um, so, and I apologize for doing that because really normally I would give the lovely introduction, but I was so afraid, like I said, that I would misstate something because this is, as I said, not really my field, but it was fascinating to me as a layperson, which I think with both of your books, they are meant to have sort of not just a science directed viewpoint, but they are meant to mean something to people, even if they don't have a strong basis in science. Is that right, Zach? Si? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I am not a scientist. I'm just, just a writer. But the lay person is the person that has the power over whether this sweet green world survives or not. So I'm honored to be writing for that audience. Yeah. Is that true of you too, Julie? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when I got the idea to write a book about jellyfish, I was like, who wants to read a book about jellyfish? And, I, and then I, but then I realized, you know, I think anyone might want to read a book about jellyfish if it's written so that there's, there's other things in there that make it a compelling read. And I really had in mind, I want to write a book about science that um, people who never have read science before might might enjoy. Yeah. So that was a big part of yeah. That was part of big part of my motivation. Yeah. So I'm going to start, uh, Julie. Why jellyfish? And people who have read the book know some of this story. But what is it about jellyfish? Yeah, I, they're definitely the underdog character, <laughs> so to speak. But um, yeah, jellyfish are um, telling us about. They're sort of the opposite of the canary in the coal mine in that there's a lot of places in the world, more than half of the coastlines where jellyfish numbers seem to be on the rise. Their abundances are growing, and um, for the reasons are a lot of the things that we are doing to the oceans. So things like coastal development without really thinking about what we're doing, overfishing, um, shipping, you know, building big canals. These, these things that seem kind of distant from us are affecting the jellyfish. So the jellyfish gave me this platform to talk about things that are really, really important in a global sense, but from a really interesting angle that a lot of people didn't know much about. Yeah. OK, Sai, so why octopuses? And I will say, lest you think that I am illiterate and they are struggling not to correct me, it is octopuses, am I right? Absolutely. OK. Yep. I grew up hearing octopi, but apparently that is incorrect. Or at least you'll be corrected if you talk to the people who study these animals. So we got to stay in their good graces. Absolutely. So um, octopuses, as I said, I'd written about lots of vertebrates before. I have 26 different books, from snow leopards to pigs to, I actually did have another eight-legger, but he was a tarantula. Um, but octopuses are so unlike us. You know, we were separated by half a billion years of evolution. Um, their, their bodies don't even go 
you know, head, body, limbs. They go body, head, limbs. The part that you think is the head is really what we consider the torso, where the uh, excretory and reproductive and, and respiratory organs are located. They taste with their skin. They have three hearts. And yet they're capable of these incredible superpowers. Um, they, they can, with one three and a half inch sucker, lift 30 pounds. And a giant Pacific octopus has 200 on each of its eight arms. And as different as this animal is, you can still have a friend who's an octopus. So the octopus afforded me a way to look at consciousness in the animal world at a time that I felt that readers might be hungering for that kind of connection. And boy, did they, did they ever fulfill everything you could ever. I had no idea that I would fall in love with an octopus so much that when the animal died, I wept. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that these octopuses would kind of be the core of this group of fabulous, disparate friendships that cut across taxa. Some of us were vertebrates, some of us were <laughs> invertebrates, some of us were marine, some were freshwater, and others were terrestrial. Mm -hmm. You talk in the book about, um, about scientists wanting to avoid anthropomorphizing animals. Um, you know, your dog doesn't want to go to the prom and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, that they don't dream of a future in the same way that people do and those kinds of things. What do you think, because uh, obviously, as you say, you came out of the book talking about having a friendship with this octopus. Mm -hmm. Where did you come down in terms of the dangers of anthropomorphizing too much versus the dangers of not understanding commonalities enough? Well, I feel that uh, modern, modern people in, in the Western world err on the wrong side. I think the biggest mistake you can make is deny that the rest of animate creation has no thoughts or feelings, that they lack emotion. I have found every single animal I've ever known clearly seems to love its life the same way I do. And if you err in the opposite direction, that's just going to make you a more compassionate person. Mm -hmm. But if you make the mistake of denying them the dignity of having a, a mind, well, that error is a much more grievous sin. Mm -hmm. Did you feel self-conscious at all when you found yourself in grief for an octopus? Does, did it feel, did it feel did strange? Did it feel odd? Well, no, because I was so overwhelmed with, with the emotion. Yeah. But here's the interesting thing. I mean, I don't think that the octopuses that I knew felt about me the same way I felt about <laughs> them. Um, but I know that they liked when I showed up because we know from scientific experiments that octopuses do recognize individual human faces just looking up through the water. We know this from scientific experiments. Mm -hmm. And we also know that they like some people and dislike others. And we, we know that because if they don't like you, they will jet away often after blasting you in the face with 47 degree freezing cold ice water. <laughs> so um, that's pretty clear. And if they like you, they will come over. Their arms will come boiling up out of the water and they will embrace you with their suckers. They'll play with you. And if they feel excited to see you, they turn red. If they feel very calm in your presence, they'll turn white beneath your touch. Mm -hmm. So I know they felt something yeah. good about me. Yeah. Julie, one of the things that I thought was so interesting reading these two books together was that um, whereas it seems like a lot of Sai's journey with the octopus is about the octopus as an individual, a lot of the, the journey with the jellyfish is the jellyfish as a bigger phenomenon and species. Uh, and in fact, you had an effort to sort of keep some jellyfish at home more like pets that did not, did not take. Don't do it. <laughs> I mean, you can't, I shouldn't say that. Some people can do it, but I think it requires a, you know, a big filtration system. And yeah, I, um, when I was working on the book, I heard about this Kickstarter for jellyfish pets and I ordered it. I got, you know, first in line and I got this tank and I put it in the dining room and I got three jellyfish and my kids named them peanut butter and jelly. 
And we, we, um, you know, we tried to keep them for a while, and it, it was really fantastic having them in our dining room where I could kind of be mesmerized by them. And they are super, there's something about watching a jellyfish move that's extremely relaxing, and it, it seems to kind of hit in this place of your heart. And in fact, um, the, the, the jellyfish around the edge of their bell, they have these many little faces, sort of, that it, it, where their sensory organs are. And there's a thing called a pacemaker, and it's, it's, that's the technical word for it, right next to each face, and that controls um, how fast the jellyfish pulses. So there's actually like this. It's like a lava lamp. Y yeah, they're like watching lava lamps, right? And, and they do seem to sort of make you calm. But um, they don't like living in living rooms, especially not in Austin, Texas. <laughs> and, and so it was, it was like kind of the goldfish from the carnival yeah. situation. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I did enjoy very much having, you know, thinking about them on an individual le level, although I th think with jellyfish maybe some of the more interesting ideas are kind of the global, the global questions mm -hmm. about them. Um, not that it isn't with octopuses as well, they have really interesting global questions and questions of how... They, they have, yeah, I think jellyfish have less personality. They do they have... They do lack a brain. They, but. Yeah, I, they, they, on an individual basis. It, although it's much, you know, much is unknown. And, mm -hmm. and also the question of how do you define in, uh, intelligence is, is a big question. How do you define pain is mm -hmm. a big question. And, and those things aren't, aren't really very well understood. Yeah, yeah Especially for right. invertebrates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a whole, it's a whole other world. Right. And with octopuses, it's easy because their intelligence is so like ours. They love to play with toys. They love to play with the same toys that our kids play with. They love Legos. They love Mr. Potato Head. There they, was one playing with a Kong, right? Oh yeah, they love the Kong. My dog has a Kong. Dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, they make they make up games. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an intelligence that we can recognize and respect. They like to solve problems. How do I open this jar? I mean, they'll they'll open a jar take the treat out of the jar, but then just for fun, some of them will just screw the top back on. <laughs> and the other thing they love to solve is how do I get out of my tank? And that right, probably they're really good at that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that made me think a lot about is it is it uh, is it finding Dory where there's an octopus I yes, think that Hank. gets out and Hank. goes <laughs> all over the floor. And I, when I first saw that in the theater, I thought, well that's that's very silly. <laughs> but Apparently not. Oh, yeah. Apparently that was that Pixar accuracy. Oh, they, they have been known to break to make break for it. I mean, yeah. they've crawled out of home aquariums and gotten halfway across the lawn trying to get to the sea and, you know, attacked by ants. Or, you know, one got out in someone's house and was found in a teapot. And there were others. There's many stories of octopuses that got out of their tank and devoured everybody else in the adjacent tank. And some of them are said to have snuck back in their tank where then they could just sit like this. <laughs> Except oh, they ate, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. Let me just stick up for the jellyfish for a second. <laughs> like, like, so the jellyfish may not have a brain, but they do have like very interesting sensory abilities, right? So they sting, like that's their way of getting around in the world is they, they, they sting with these stinging cells, which you probably know if you've ever been stung. And that stinging cell explodes with an acceleration of five million Gs. So that's like five million times the acceleration of gravity. And it's the fastest motion in the animal kingdom. But jellyfish don't sting each other, right? Wow. So somehow they know this is my species. I shouldn't sting them unless I want to eat them. And so they, they don't do that. They also, you know, they have on those little faces I was talking about, they have eye spots and they can see and they have a touch plate where they can smell and, and t sense currents. And so they will accumulate where there's food. They migrate up and down day to night so that they don't get eaten by birds diving into the water. Um, I mean, they have, they're the oldest swimmers on our planet. So they have some intelligence in a way, or something, these survival skills that have allowed them to stay around this long. Mm -hmm. So I just had to stick up. No, no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. They can't just, unscrew a jar, but, they, <laughs> but, they, but they've been here 
here longer than any of us. <laughs> but it's a different kind of intelligence that we don't we don't appreciate because yeah. it's not like ours. Exactly. What freaks me out about octopus is that here's the thing that doesn't look like a us right. at all that squeezes its bone boneless body through an opening the size of an orange if it's hundred pounds that tastes with its skin and has blue blood and its brain is wrapped around its throat and yet we recognize and appreciate a lot of its intelligence so right. similar to ours their eyes are very similar to ours. right wait but okay so this is really cool like <laughs> there are no, octopuses have eyes that are similar to ours. They're like camera eyes. Mm -hmm. And the box jelly, which is, you know, the most toxic animal in the world, it has um, eight eyes that are camera eyes, just like ours do. They have 24 eyes, and, and um, eight of them have a lens, a retina, and an iris that opens and closes in response to light. And that's jellyfish, so that's, yeah. Well, who needs a brain? Right, really? that's a question. I mean, <laughs> it's a very good question. Just because you don't have a brain doesn't mean you don't have any sense. Exactly. So. <laughs> well, it, it raises an interesting question, what you're talking about. Not only what do we mean by intelligence, which I think is one thing that you're both talking about, but what do we mean by a soul? In the title of your book, um, The Soul of an Octopus, what do you mean by a soul? What does a soul mean to you? Uh, <laughs> I'm glad that's your question. Well, no, it's, <laughs> this, this was something I've given a lot of thought. I mean, I think all of us, all of us wonder, uh -huh. you know, do we even have a soul? Is a soul the same thing as, as a self? Is, is a self the component of consciousness that matters? And there's different philosophers that look at this in different ways, and some philosophers human philosophers will say that we don't have selves. Well, I th thought I did, but you know, they'll even say we don't have a self, much less a soul. I was, I was raised in Methodist Church, so I believed that humans and animals had a soul. And I always believed that it was something of the holy in the soul. And when I look around, at all the lives that animate this, this world, I feel there's this, there's this great quote that's attributed to Thales and Miletus that says, the universe is alive, it has fire in it, and it's full of gods. And to me, that says that this world that we live in is so much more alive, and so much more incandescent, and so much more holy then we might dare dream. So I would say, yes, octopuses have a soul. Mm -hmm. And I would say jellyfish have a soul. <laughs> and that we should behave towards them as if they are holy in the same way that our lives are holy. Yeah, I mean, yes. I, you know, jellyfish have this really interesting s situation. And they have a very complicated life cycle. and. Um, they, um, the, the Medusa part that we're familiar with is only a very small part of their life cycle. Much of it is lived as a polyp, which is like a sea anemone. And that polyp uh, actually slices itself horizontally, and then each one of those, those pancakes, I guess, pops off and becomes a Medusa that we, that we see. And then that polyp, which is planted on the bottom of a dock or the underside of a, you know, jetty or something like that, it can it can grow again and do the the same thing. It's called strebulation, where it cuts itself into these like twenty four slices, and then they all pop off and become Medusa, um, over and over and over. And so I was talking to some jellyfish scientists, and I said, "Are we thinking about jellyfish correctly when we think about them as animals?" Aren't they more plant-like, where the polyp is sort of like the tree, and the medusa are like the apples, you know, casting themselves off to reproduce and form new trees? Um, and the jellyfish scientists, and I really had been thinking about that, you know, sometimes when, when trees are stressed, they will produce a lot of offspring in order to find places where there's a better place to be living. And I was thinking about the oceans and how we're damaging them. And maybe these blooms of jellyfish were happening because they're trying to find new habitat. 
And the jellyfish scientists cautioned me, and they were like, no, don't think about it like that because of what you said, because they are animals. And to deny their animal nature means that you don't understand the jellyfish. And so I think that, yes, you know, jellyfish are animated by the same thing that animates all animals. And it's very important to, to remember that and to, 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 to realize, um, I mean, I think the jellyfish are telling us something about the damage we're doing to our oceans and that they are animals that are, are you know, proliferating and we should pay attention to those, those signals. Mm -hmm. How do you- Kind of got a little away from the soul thing, but yeah. No, sure, I mean, I think, I think part of what you're getting at in the book is that the jellyfish, I think the, as I said, I think the, the, the inspection of the octopus is a little more individual and the inspection of the jellyfish is more at a species level, but they're both, like Sai was saying, they're both something holy and meaningful. Yeah. Um, because one of the things that you talk about is how the jellyfish, the role that the jellyfish plays in so many different parts of the ecosystems that they, where they live, because they're both, they prey on certain things and are preyed upon by certain things and all of that. Is that true? It's true, yeah. And so the, the thing about jellyfish is that we don't know as much about them as we wish we did. And, and part of that is because the way we studied the oceans in most of the 20th century, once we got boats and motors and winches and nets, was really fast. We'd drive through the ocean, pull these big nets behind the boats, pull everything up and dump it on the back of a ship and then sort through it. And that jellyfish don't handle that treatment very well. So we obliterated our baseline for understanding jellyfish. And in fact, sometimes they would pour bleach on the boat to really dissolve away the jellyfish and, and disable their stings. So, um, yeah, so we don't know a lot about what's, you know, this is one of the big controversies in the book that I try to uncover is this, this question of what's really happening with the jellyfish, and it's very hard to tell because the baseline is so, so poor. And I forgot the question. Well, I'm not sure what the question is. <laughs> so, so. I think you probably did a better job answering than the question you're asking. Oh, the collective. Um, I did want to ask you both, one of the things that the jellyfish and the octopus have in common is a, a sort of a history of perceived menace. Ah. Uh, because you talk about the octopus and the kind of the giant of the sea and the whole idea of boats being sucked under and, and all of that business. Uh, where do you, did you wind up um, feeling like that's an overblown idea, given the likelihood that people have actually oh. ever seen an octopus that big? Oh, honest to God, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm always on the side of the underdog, you know? Um, I, I just wrote a book about hyenas, and I'm working on one on vultures. So, you know, <laughs> but they're magnificent creatures, you know? The hyena's actually one of the top predators who steals, he doesn't steal his food from the lion, the lion steals from him. And um, you can go on and on and on yeah. and on. But it's wonderful to be able to find something that, that looks like it's one way and then discovering it's the opposite. And particularly with an animal like a jellyfish or an octopus, because both are such agents and, and symbols of transformation. When you were talking about you know, how you start out as a medusa, which looks like something that you found on the bottom of your shoe and then <laughs> grows up to be one of those beautiful things you can ever imagine. And octopuses are, you know, as people know, they, they change color and shape. They can sprout spots or stripes. They can change color in less than a second. Um, first, they look like a whole bunch of, of striped snakes, and the next thing you know, they're, they're looking like a piece of coral, and no, they're something else. Um, and I think that's why both of these animals, I think, can speak to us at a time that our very Earth is undergoing this huge transformational, um, it's huge change. And f for me, the octopus was an agent of transformation because it opened the world to me in a way that had never been opened before. And I, as I was writing about these animals and learning about the sea, at the same time, the institution where I was getting to know the octopuses best, I did learn to scuba dive, but the ones that I knew best lived at the aquarium. It was undergoing a huge transformation. It was being, it was rebuilding the giant ocean tank. And so change was all around us. 
Yeah, and the jellyfish, there are some harrowing jellyfish stories in well, the book. The Diana Nyad story is yeah. amazing. Yeah, I mean, jellyfish, you know, they have definitely been seen as an agent of menace. And, you know, they, 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 some of them d do deserve it. Um, I mean, not be, but you know, you have to remember that we are not, we're not the object of their sting, they're, they're, the prey is, we just get in their way. And so, um, yeah, the story, the box jellies that I mentioned, the ones with the 24 eyes, eight of which are camera eyes, they are also the most toxic group of jellyfish in the world, and um, one of them can kill in three minutes. It's, it's perhaps the most toxic animal in the world. And um, Diana Nyad, who I'm not sure if you know, she was, she was, she's an amazing long distance competitive swimmer and at something like 63 decided to swim from Cuba to the Keys, the Florida Keys, and she tried four times and failed, not because she wasn't strong enough, not because she couldn't handle the salt water chafing inside her throat, not because she couldn't stay up for the 53 hours that it takes to swim that far, but because of jellyfish stinging her. So she actually had to put together like a jellyfish team and develop gear that went all the way down her throat so that she wouldn't get stung in, in her mouth. And, and she did it on the last try. Um, she's the only person to have ever made that swim. Yeah. But she had a, a jellyfish scientist pretty much swimming besides her the whole time. Yeah. Did you, Sai, when you, you were talking before about the, the kind of the relationship with the octopus and meeting the octopus and how they welcome and greet you, the description in the book of kind of your first up close encounter with an octopus is, um, I'm not gonna say it's like a love scene exactly, but it's, <laughs> it's, very, it's very tactile. It's a very kind of, you use, the, you use a comparison to a kiss quite a bit. Mm. Um, what was that moment of encountering that octopus like for you? Oh man, well it, it, was, it was really transformative. I'd never known anyone like that before. Also, very <laughs> seldom you know, are, are people feeling and tasting you so early in your relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and other people who've put their hands in with an octopus have recoiled because okay, it's it's it is cold, it is slimy, um, they're sucking on you. You're going to have to go home and explain to your husband why you were covered with hickeys after you came across. <laughs> so, um, but I was never at all afraid when I first met Athena, even though she was pulling me into the tank. But I I wanted to go into the tank, but I I knew I wouldn't I knew mm -hmm. I wouldn't fit, and I also had some strong people there who would pull me out of the tank if I, yeah. if I needed to. Um, interestingly though, octopuses are also venomous. They are all venomous and some are deadly. But I never worried that these octopuses would bite me. And only once have I seen someone bitten by an octopus and the octopus chose not to envenomate. Mm -hmm. So isn't that nice? That's cool, they can choose whether or not to be venomous. Yes, totally, yeah. And of course they choose whether or not to bite you in the, in the first place. And, um, and I, I think, you know, when um, th this octopus, her name was Kali, and she bit a friend of mine, a teenager named Anna. And here's the cool thing about octopuses. I mean, talk about sensitive new age guy. They are tasting and feeling you at the same time. And they're not just tasting, I believe, the surface of your skin, but I think they can taste the, the blood beneath. Wow. And I think the reason that she was bitten was she was on various different medicines and she had changed her medicine. And I think she tasted differently. Oh, wow. And that she was trying to figure out like, what's, what's going, going on? on? Yeah. Maybe I should bite you, you know? That's interesting, wow. Yeah, well you both seem to have had experiences that partly involve figuring out how to think about a type of animal that a lot of people grow up without a framework for. Um, how do you think about this animal? Do you think about it more like a dog or a cat, or do you think about it more like a, a worm or a plant even, right? right? Um, and one of the things that made me think about, I mentioned before my dog likes a Kong, my dog totally accidentally the other day caught me with a tooth, that's Ooh. what this is. Oh. And I spent so much time trying to figure out, I realized I was thinking about it in terms of like, well, he didn't mean it. 
which is a very weird, very human way to try to analyze animal behavior. And it's very difficult, I think, to get out of that habit of trying to think about an animal the way you would think about a person, especially if you're close to them. Um, so what do you think, how do you think about invertebrates in general at this point? Um, how, what is your framework for kind of thinking about jellyfish? I, I think I've always seen invertebrates as the rulers of our world. I mean, as I said, there's way more invertebrates than vertebrates. And, um, you know, they were here before us and they will be here after us. And, um, yeah, I, I think to see, to see it as a reflection of us all the time is maybe a little self-centered, you know, and I think, um, but I do think that we have reached this stage where we, we are very powerful on this planet and we are changing it at a chemical um, level that's, that's extremely, um, yeah, scary. And so, you know, the, I think the cephalopods and the cnidarians will, will, will weather that storm probably more easily than I do. I, I think that's where my thoughts go most yeah. often when I think about invertebrates. Um, because, because they've been through it before. They've been through massive shifts in the planet's climate and temperature, and they have um, very ancient behaviors that, you know, they, that allow them to, to withstand those things. Like jellyfish, some jellyfish can walk along, the, when they're in the polyp stage, which is like the sea anemone stage, they can walk along the seafloor and leave uh, parts of their feet, parts of the bottom of them behind, almost like a little seed. And those seeds can live for a decade or more, we don't know, until conditions change and then burst out and become a polyp again. So um, I, I don't know how, I, yeah, I feel like they, they have very, very good um, behaviors that can, can protect them more than us. That, yeah. That's what I think about most often. Yeah. How do you think about the octopus right. these days, Sai? Si? Well, there, there are so, the thing that is striking to me is that as alien as they seem, they are very much like us in the way mm -hmm. we think. Um, one thing that I learned in my research from a scientist who's been studying octopuses for a long time, Dr. Jennifer Mather, is that the same neurotransmitters that we have when we're in love when we're frightened, when we're happy, those same neurotransmitters are present in all animals that they've ever looked for, including oxytocin, which you may have heard of. That's the cuddle hormone. It's called the cuddle hormone. It's actually like a, a social hormone. But um, in mammals, it facilitates milk -like letdown. It facilitates um, uh, social bonding with your, with your offspring. Well, octopuses have their eggs at the very end of their lives. They use their last breath to blow their tiny paralarvae out of their lair. They don't have maternal care after that. They don't get to know their children. But they have a neurotransmitter so like oxytocin, it's called cephalotocin. So as different as we are in a very basic way, mm -hmm we're also shockingly similar. So I think one of the greater sins than anthropomorphism is anthropocentrism, believing it is all about us. And just as you pointed out that they have these incredible abilities, I mean, being able to leave pieces of your feet at, as in your footsteps for, right. for pieces of you to grow up, um, my gosh, I mean, okay, so we, can, we invented writing. But, <laughs> yeah. but we're not leaving wow. pieces of our feet behind. <laughs> yeah, actually, on that topic, it's actually very interesting. After my book was published, um, it turns out some graduate students at Caltech were messing around with jellyfish, and they were watching them, and they're like, oh, they seem to chill out at night. Like, what's up with that? 
And it turns out jellyfish can sleep. And they actually put melatonin in the tank and it put the jellyfish to sleep. Wow. So just like us. Like the receptors. Yeah, just yeah. the same receptors. You know, melatonin is a sleep receptor for, or transmitter for us. I don't know what exactly it is. But anyway, it helps us sleep. Yeah. And it works on jellyfish too. So these, these um, neurotransmitters, you know, these chemicals that affect our behaviors come to us from a very, very long time ago. Yeah. And we do share a lot in common with these animals that are even, you know, 500 or 650 million years old. So yeah. we're all family. Yeah. And that's the way we should behave. <laughs> well, we have uh, enough time for just, I think, a few questions. If people have questions about an octopus, a jellyfish <laughs> that you might have known uh, <laughs> or not known, go ahead. I, uh, thank you. This was really, really interesting. Um, if I go to the Baltimore Aquarium and I ask the people there about the octopus or the jellyfish, are they on board with what you're saying? Are they, you know, the relationship between you and aquariums to get your information, the research that you did? Um, I mean, will they give me the same kind of information that you're giving out today, or are they, you know, more cutting edge, or are they behind, or, you know, what is it? Because a lot of people will go to an aquarium to find information about sea life. Well, a lot of the, I have found that um, the keepers mm -hmm. of octopus always named their octopus, even when they weren't supposed to. And a lot of the stuff that scientists later found out just bore out things that the people who actually worked with these animals already knew. They already knew how smart these animals were before we gave them anything like IQ tests. And we're actually going to the Baltimore Aquarium. Oh. <laughs> um, and I've, I've been there before, and I've, I've met some of the folks who are volunteers and who work there, and they seem to have great respect for their, for their creatures. Yeah, I don't know people at the Baltimore Aquarium, but um, at the jellyfish facilities I've been to, like in Monterey Bay, um, those jellyfish breeders are unbelievable, and they know, they are, they go to all the scientific meetings with the scientists, and they are scientists, so they know, a, yeah, they know a very much about jellyfish. Um, I, I don't know all aquaria, but yeah, the ones I've talked to are incredibly knowledgeable. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, we're over here. Thank you so much. Very provocative. Um, I'm looking forward to read both books. Great. Thank you. With the products and inventions that have come from biomimicry, could you talk a little about any breakthroughs that either through octopuses or jellyfish we've been able to make some breakthroughs? I have a great story. Oh, good, go. Uh, so I went and talked to some robotic, some people making robotic jellyfish. And um, this is really one of my favorite stories in the book. But by trying to make jellyfish robots, they discovered um, that it's not, it's not the the push of the jellyfish that makes it go forward, it's actually that, that peplum, the flap, the very pretty part of the jelly. It doesn't have any muscles in it, but just the, um, the movement of it is actually what drives the jellyfish forward through the water. And what they later discovered is that, that the wiggle creates these turbulent eddies that create a low pressure system in front of the animal. So jellyfish are actually sucking themselves through the water, the way, like if you take a breath, yeah. And, and if you start looking around in the ocean, you start noticing, how does everything swim? Well, they all wiggle, everything wiggles. And the reason for that wiggle is to create this low pressure that pulls marine creatures and aquatic creatures through the water rather than pushes. And we're so, you know, we're so terrestrial. When we walk, we push back on the ground behind us, but that's not what goes on in the ocean. So it was an extraordinary discovery, and it came from looking at jellyfish swimming. Mm -hmm. oh, that is great. Yeah. Well, and I know that they are looking at um, octopuses as models for soft robots, for example. Right. So, I mean, because they're just made like nothing else. Right. And they have such strength, you know, to be able, and they have strength and precision. The sucker is so dexterous. It's super strong. As I mentioned earlier, a three and a half inch sucker can lift 30 pounds, but it's also dexterous enough that they can untie knots in surgical silk. 
which they discovered when they did operations on octopus and they, in the morning they come in and all this <laughs> silk is just untied. All right, let's go back over here. Um, thank you both for being here. I grew up in Hawaii and I love eating octopus. <gasps> and so, uh, but I'm also fascinated by both jellyfish and octopus and I, both, I know that both are delicacies. And so I was just wondering what your thoughts were on both of them being delicacies. Do they, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but they call it hei? That... Um, I grew up with a thing in the Japanese taco. Uh, so knowing oh, it as a taco. Oh, I, I'm, I've been a vegetarian for a long time. So um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm not going to eat them. But a lot of people have come up to me after reading the book saying, oh, I can't eat them now. Mm -hmm. um, but I tell people, you know, well, good for you. Um, but if you want to help octopuses, the most important thing you can do is help the sea. Yeah. And helping the sea, probably the most important thing you can do is try to stop or slow global warming because it is affecting the sea worse. Could you talk a little bit about eating jellyfish? Yeah, jellyfish have been eaten in Asia for a thousand years, and they're, um, they, they are all protein, and they are packed with antioxidants. So they have been kind of used um, also pharmaceutically for things like arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, understanding what that would mean for Western markets is still, still sort of being explored. Um, and I, I tasted them when I went to Japan chasing a, the giant jellyfish, which grows to be 500 pounds. Um, I, I went out with a commercial fisherman, and we caught jellyfish. And his wife served me some jellyfish salad. And to me, it tasted um, very much like green pepper. It was really, really. Uh, not exotic tasting at all. So um, the, the thing is, one of the ways they preserve it, jellyfish are so watery, they're 95% water, that you have to kind of pickle them. You have to pull the water out really fast or they spoil. And um, they use this salt called alum, which isn't very good for us in Asia. And then what they do is they rinse it and they pull the alum out before they turn it into a salad. But um, that's probably not going to fly in Western markets. So there's Italians, Italian foodies who are looking at it, um, doing other things like sous vide or fast freezing. And anyway, you know, the, there are so many in places where the oceans are out of kilter and the blooms are really big. There is this question of should we be eating jellyfish? You know, and and so I I don't think that question is settled right now. I think it's one of these kind of emerging questions and answers that we really are going to have to think about. Um, it's not as clear as, as with octopus. Yeah. Well, sea turtles eat jellyfish. Yeah, sea turtles and sea turtle eat. populations are plummeting. I don't know if that's also contributing. Um, yeah, they are. In fact, people who study sea turtles look for the jellyfish. They go out on airplanes looking for jellyfish and, and then they in order to find the sea turtles. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's go over here. Thank you. Um, I guess the biggest question I have is, even listening to you guys talk, um, that we separate ourselves from the animal kingdom. And if we brought ourselves back into it, could we deal with these issues, you know, a little, make it closer to home? And I'm not sure if that's anything you can answer, but. That's, that's why I write. Yeah, I don't think it would hurt. <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, the us and them thing, if it's them, you can do anything you want to them. But if it's us, if we're all one family, then it's a whole different thing. It's, it's, about, it's, it's about expanding your capacity for compassion. I think you hit the nail on the head. Thank you. OK. Julia, a lot of um, book clubs read your book. And I can't believe that they're just reading about jellyfish. I can't is there, <laughs> is, what What is it about your book that book clubs um, seem to be drawn to? Um, so the book is not just science. There's memoir, as Sai's book has memoir also. And um, the book is about me learning to grow my own spine as a, as a writer. And um, so my story's in there. Uh, you can find out about you know my terrible grad school experiences and my bad boyfriend and you know, like, lots of things that um, hopefully help the reader 
move through the book and, and, and see how I, I, um, I really grew as I followed jellyfish around the world and tried to understand what, what's happening with them in today's oceans. And, you know, I, I, the, the reason it's called spineless is because the jellyfish are spineless and because I had to kind of grow my own spine and then because of our collective spinelessness towards the health of our, our planet, um, as Sai was saying. All right, I think we can get through both of these if we go quick. Um, in either of your research, did you encounter um, experiments, for lack of a better word, with uh, invertebrates and in music? I'm sorry? Invertebrates and in music? Oh. I don't think octopuses can hear the way that we do, but they certainly sense vibrations. And boy, if you wanted someone to dance, no one could be more graceful. <laughs> <laughs> I did not find anything with jellyfish in music, but it's a great question. Um, I'm, I know they can sense currents, and um, it's a, oh, I do have one story. Yeah, when, when the jellyfish stinging cell, the stinging cell actually has uh, hair cells, just like inside of our ears, as a trigger mechanism. And they listen for the buzz of a zooplankton, which would be like the buzz of a fly. Oh my gosh. And if it's the correct frequency, and they can also have these, there's these sugar sensors that smell like zooplankton are kind of like pig pen, they give off all these sugars. And so if it senses both the sugars and the correct frequency, then it will trigger the cell. And then it gets even crazier. They also have a sensor that smell, smells proline, which is in crustacean blood and they twist those hair cells so that they detect a higher frequency. And if they smell, a, 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 it's like hitting a zooplankton, it will panic and it will buzz at a higher frequency and its blood will be in the water. It will send off a second battery of stinging cells. So, and they've actually, the jellyfish have repair proteins to fix those hair cells on their stinging cells if they are disrupted. In our cochlea, we don't have them, which is why when we hear loud noises, we can go deaf. And they have extracted those repair proteins from, actually from sea anemones, which were easier to grow in the lab, and applied them to damaged mouth, mouse cochlea, and it repaired the hair proteins in the cochlea. So they're looking at it as more for military, like if you're around a big explosion, they could get this repair proteins in your inner ear and fix, fix that up. So yeah, that's the only sound and jellyfish um, answer I have. But yeah. yeah, sounds like they have everything they need to hear music, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sai, um, I think one of my favorite parts of your book is when you talk about the sea star and how, I think it was the sea star, and he, how he's trying to get the food from the octopus or interested in when they're feeding the octopus in the tank. Um, and so I was wondering if you and Julie also yourself, if you're planning on writing any more books about invertebrates. I just found this topic really fascinating and would love to learn more about some other animals that are out there in this category. Boy, well, there's certainly, there's, there's a, a lot of potential subjects out there, because most of us are marine invertebrates, most of us animals on Earth. So yeah, I would, I would love to. I'm, I have a memoir coming out uh, later this month in which we have a little more on octopus, because um, they're almost inexhaustible to write about. Um, but the next book I'm researching is actually not a marine invertebrate, but it's actually, it's rays. Um, a, marine vertebrate, but yeah, I'd love to, I would love to do more. Yeah, yeah I started actually on a fiction book <laughs> about a 16-year-old girl who saves the world from climate change, so <laughs> I really want to get that, um, but I think there's a coral book in me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much, and thank all of you for being here. Bye, Julie, thank you guys for being here.